So we're going to talk about the basics of geometry and I want to start by looking at a very old textbook from Greece and I have it right here in Greek and English side by side. This is the book Elements by Euclid and that is E-U-C-L-I-D and so a lot of times when we're talking about geometry we talk about Euclidean geometry Euclidean geometry because Euclid wrote this first book that really lays out the, the rules for geometry and so there are uh, 23 of them in the first book, 23 definitions, and we're going to go through these um, in modern terms, and I have guided notes here for you, and they're on the website, so please be sure that you print them out. It'll make it easier for you. So we're going to go through the definitions. We'll draw a diagram, and we'll actually match it up to the original definition by Euclid from a very, very long time ago. Okay, so let's start. A blank is a flat surface made up of points. Well, that's called a plane. Okay? And a plane is just a piece of paper or any flat surface. And uh, we can try to draw it here. I'll try to draw it in three dimension, but I'm not really an artist. So you kind of draw this thing and you have you have stuff going in this direction across it if you can imagine like a sheet of paper coming out of the coming out of the page right there I'm trying to draw it in three dimensions and so you have stuff going um, going up and down and left and right and that's kinda what a plane is okay and that follows um, Euclid's definitions five and seven if you're interested in that okay a line is a collection of points in the same direction. So if you think about it, a line is something like this, and we're really just putting all these points in the same direction right there. And so we have a line, and we have points all along this line, and there's actually an infinite number of points that make up the line. And so that is what a line is, and that follows definitions 2 and 3 of Euclid. Okay? A point is simply a location on a coordinate plane. And so if you remember from algebra last year, you know we have axes, we have a y-axis and an x-axis here and so uh, if this is x and this is y and we have just a point here it's just a location it's just a location and we usually address it as x y but we don't have to do that if we're not looking at actual if we don't care about numbers or distances it's just a location somewhere okay and that is Euclid's postulate number one points that lie on the same line are said to be collinear. If you remember from algebra last year when we started talking about linear, that means uh, stuff involving a line. And so collinear means on the same line. The prefix co means same. And so if we draw a line I'll draw the line this way. So if we draw the line here and we say that this is point A and this is point B, they're on the same line, so they are collinear. And that is postulate, or excuse me, definition number four. Now points that lie in the same plane are said to be coplanar. Okay? And so if we, if we try to draw our plane again like this as, you know, a sheet of paper coming out of the 
and I'm kind of trying to draw it a little curved just so that it looks like you have a, like a perspective thing. And so you have different points here on the same plane. Maybe that's A and that's B. A and B are coplanar. And that is definition number six. Okay. All right. A line segment refers to a specific piece of a line that has endpoints. A line segment. Okay. And so if we talk about this line, okay, let's just say this line right here. And we say that this is A and this is B. Well, this is the line AB. This is a line. But if we just talk about the segment that goes from A to B, and we're not interested in continuing the line on forever, if we're just interested in this A to B, well, then that is line segment AB. You see the difference? It doesn't, it doesn't continue on out here to the end. It, it doesn't go out here at all anymore. You see that? Okay. The midpoint is the point that is located exactly halfway in between these endpoints. And so the midpoint is right there, and the midpoint M is the midpoint. Okay. A ray is a part of a line, has one endpoint, and extends indefinitely in one direction. So, whereas a line went in both directions infinitely, okay, this one starts at point A, goes through point B, and continu continues on forever. Okay. An angle is formed by two non-collinear rays that have a common endpoint, and uh, that common endpoint is called the vertex. Okay, and so if we have two non-collinear rays, that means that they are two rays that are not on the same line, so those are not on the same line, and they share a common endpoint, and then they extend here. So let's say this is A, B, and C. Well, we have ray AB, and by the way, you would write this as AB with a little ray over it, of course. So this would be ray AB, and this would be ray AC, and A is the vertex right there. So that, that's the vertex right there. Okay? And that is definition number eight in Euclid's book. Two angles that have the same measure are said to be congruent. Well, you're, you might think, well, wait a minute, doesn't that just mean they're equal? We usually say the word equal when two things are the same. Well, that's true, but in geometry, we're not just going to be looking at values anymore. We're not just going to be looking at numbers. We're going to be looking at shape and maybe orientation or direction or things like that. Um, and we have to be able to talk about those in a slightly different way. And so let me give you two examples here. And let's say that, uh, that this angle here has a measure of, I don't know, 30 degrees. And so does this one. Even though they are not pointing in the same direction or anything, they are considered to be congruent. That's how we would describe those, because they have the same measure. Okay. 
A ray that divides an angle into two angles of equal measure is said to bisect. Bisect, split into two. So if I have an angle, okay, and then I draw another angle, let's call this again A, B, and C, okay, and then let's draw in another angle, another, excuse me, another ray, and I'm just sketching this by the way, I'm not doing any of this by uh, with actually measuring it, I'm just sketching it out. So let's say we draw in that ray, and that is ray AD, and we have drawn AD such that this is the same as this. Those two little angles are the same. Then AD is the bisector. Okay, so AD is the bisector there. It bisects angle BAC. Two angles whose measures together have a sum of 90 degrees are said to be complementary. So what this means, and they do not have to be right next to each other, but let's just say that we have something like this. And I have this angle and I have this angle. And let's say that this angle here is, uh, let's say, 40 degrees, and this one is 50 degrees. Then those two angles together, 40 plus 50, equals 90 degrees, so they would, they would be complementary. And we have another name when measures together are 180 degrees, and that is supplementary. Okay, and so let's say that we had something like this, where we have this angle here and this angle here, and let's say this angle here is, um, we'll say it's 40, 40 degrees again, and this is 140. Well then, 140 plus 40 is 180 degrees, so that would be supplementary. Okay, An angle whose measure is 90 degrees is called a right angle. Now that's very, very obvious, and I don't even really need to go into detail on this. That's just what we call an angle that has a 90 degree orientation. That's called a right angle. An angle whose measure is less than 90 degrees is called acute. And so This would be acute because that looks like it's about 30 degrees, so it's less than 90 degrees. Um, oh, and by the way, I forgot this. Hang on. Um, these these words are modern definitions, so they don't have um, Euclid does not have a uh, definition for those. But the right angle, this is definition number 10. Sorry, I missed that one. Acute. This is definition number 12. And, <clears throat> of course, after that, we have to talk about obtuse angles, which are greater than 90, but smaller than 180. So that would be, let's say, that's 150 degrees, about. That's obtuse, and that is definition 11 in Euclid. Okay. A closed figure whose sides are all line segments is a polygon. Okay, and um, you, really you, you, you've already known this, but we're just calling it uh, something new now. So if I say, you know, I have this weird shaped, let's make it a pentagon here, some really bizarre looking thing, right? five sides 
it's a pentagon. But each of these sides, this side, this side, this side, this side, and this side, are all line segments because I have parts of lines and they all have endpoints right there, right? So that is definitions 14 and then 19 through 22. Euclid divides these up into different definitions for different numbers of sides, so that's why there's multiple of them here. Okay. When you are calculating the perimeter of one of these figures, which was a polygon, that's what I'm talking about right there, Okay, you are summing, that means to add, the lengths of all the sides, which again are line segments. And this is definition 13, and let's just say that I had this same weird looking pentagon up here, and I'm just going to, again, I'm just sketching this so it may not turn out to be exactly like I want it to, but it's close enough. And let's say that I had, this is, uh, let's say this is 2, and this is 5, and this is 4, and this is 3, and this is 6. Then the perimeter would be 2 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 6, right? So 2, 5, 4, 3, 6. 2 plus 5 is 7, plus 4 is 11 plus 3 is 14, plus 6 is 20. Okay. Now next we're going to derive the Pythagorean theorem. And deriving the Pythagorean theorem is uh, the first time that you really get a taste of derivations. And when I say derivations, deriving, uh, that's a way of mathematically uh, presenting an argument for why something is what it is. It's kind of like a proof, um, but it's more of a formal thing, and usually uh, derivations are, are well, well known, and different mathematicians will know what you're talking about when you say that. So, I want to start by drawing this thing that looks like this. Okay, so I'm going to draw a square, and I made that a little bit too short. So there's that. I'm just drawing a square with, uh, and the side length doesn't actually matter. I'm making them three inches, but it, it doesn't matter at all. It's a derivation. It'll work for any size square that you draw. Okay. And then <clears throat> I'm going to just make a mark at the same position on every side. And again, I'm making this one inch away, but it doesn't matter where you make the mark because a derivation will work for any size setup. Okay? And now I'm just going to sketch in the sides of this smaller square. Okay. And so now I have, if you look at it, I have a big square, I have a smaller square, and I have little tiny triangles right here. And they're all the same. And because I made this length right here, I made this length the same on all sides. So I'm going to call that length A. So that means this is A, and this is A, and this is A. And since I made the original big figure A square, and I'm subtracting off the A for all the same sides, then that means that this leftover part is also going to be the same on each side. And so I'm going to call that B, which means that's B, and that's B, and that's B. Okay. So let's look at what we have here. So the big square The big square area is A plus B, which is this whole length of the side, A plus B squared. Okay? <clears throat> 
So using our algebra skills, we know we have to expand this, and we can FOIL and get that. And so that's the area of the big square, okay? Now, the area of the big square is also the sum is the sum of the four triangles plus the small square. Do you agree with that? So again, the, the big square here is, is also going to be the area of these four small squares, uh, excuse me, four small triangles, plus this square, right? Okay, so if this is a square, let's call the side of it C, which means that all of these are C's going through, okay? So using this method, four triangles plus the small square. Well, each of the triangles is going to be one-half AB, because it's my base and my height here, okay? One-half AB, and I'm just looking at any of these is the same thing, because they're all identical, so I'm just looking at this right here, okay? One-half AB, and then there are four of those, so I'm going to multiply by four, and then I'm going to add the area of the smaller square, which is just c squared. Okay, so going this method, the 4 and the 1 half cancels and gives me 2ab plus c squared. Okay, so essentially what I'm saying here is that I've calculated the area of the big square two different methods. So this has to be the same as this because I've just calculated the big square area so these have to be equal to each other okay so let's see what happens when we work that out so so I'm saying that this part has to be equal to this part so the first part said a squared plus 2ab plus b squared and that has to be equal to this part here, 2ab plus c squared. I'm just saying that these have to be equal to each other because all I did was figure out the area of the big square two different ways. But the big square isn't changing, so these two different ways have to give me the same number. Okay? And so then if you notice, these two cancel, and you're left with a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And that is indeed the Pythagorean theorem.